Well, in Nebraska, the operator of the Milligan One wind farm in Saline County is taking legal action against the County Board of Adjustment. Milligan One is a 99 turbine, 300 megawatt project that went operational in May of 2021. It's a combination of Vesta's V110s, Siemens Gamesa 2.7s, and Siemens Gamesa 4.5 machines. It's operated by EDF Renewables, and they invested about $350 million into the site and created about 200 construction jobs while they were building it. And they're about to pay $100 million in property tax uh, for the lifetime of that project. Well, the the County Board of Adjustments uh, imposed a retroactive noise limit on the turbines, and the limit is really low. Now, the Milligan One project was approved by the county back in 2016, when there, and there was no wind turbine noise requirement back then. And uh, obviously, this is creating a huge conflict, uh, and they're going to end up in court. Clearly, they have been in court and asking a, the the operators, asking the judge to, to basically stay the regulation and let them to keep operating because if they do have to shut down, they're talking about $120,000 a day in losses from that site. This is a big deal. Now, this this situation is not necessarily unique. There's a lot of, of, of counties and jurisdictions around the United States that are putting in restrictions on wind turbine development, wind turbine noise, um, some of the flicker requirements have been popping up more recently. And it has become, it was sort of localized, Phil, for a long time. And now it seems to spread. So like large parts of where I'm from in Nebraska, there's, there's several counties that are essentially putting regulations that prohibit large developments of, of wind energy. Same thing in Ohio. We've seen similar things there. And I know you've been, you and Intelstore have been following it a lot more closely than I have. Maybe you ought to give everybody a little bit of background here on what's happening out there. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, so this this has been, uh, as you said, a growing challenge for the industry. Uh, what started off a few years ago is just, you know, a few kind of quote unquote anti wind noisemakers um, were or troublemakers were were basically now getting you know funding together, and I'll give you three guesses where the funding might be coming from. Uh, you'll only need one, but. The, the reality is that this has escalated into a rather serious situation now where uh, there was a report actually put together by uh, Columbia University Law School. Um, it was originally published in 2021, uh, updated in 2022, and again in um, March of 2023, published um, May of this year. And based on their most recent update, uh, they have identified at least 44 states that have either a county and township level um, moratorium restriction or something that precludes wind and solar development, um, as inclusive of nine states that have, um, you know, like a statewide, you know, covering a blanket thing, covering all counties within within the state. Um now, the only one state that's actually seen a repeal of that has been Illinois. Um, but even in that case, I mean, you what you have now is a local populace that used to take great advantage uh, commercially from, you know, having these easement payments and, and um, you know, wind turbines on their farms and, and whatnot to communities that are now getting together and saying, I mean, even since this report was published in May, um, that has said there are 228 uh, county-level restrictions across the 44 states in the U.S. Um, there are 293 wind and solar projects that have been either blocked from being built or delayed significantly um, and materially to... Um, have adjustments made for either noise or shadow flicker, etc. Um, this is becoming an issue for the entire industry. And like I said, I mean, people who used to take great benefit from wind and solar, you know, on their property or in their community are now opposing any additional um, development. Um, even if it's not going to be in their county anymore, you know, there, there may be, uh, sites that, that are going in in adjacent counties and, um, they don't even want to see it happening, happening there. What happened? 
Like, what's, let's go, what happened when American Wind Energy Association, when it was a WIA, used to go out and talk to all the, the local people in the county level and, and, was, and had a, a big push? There's a lot of proponents of wind not that long ago. That seems to have dramatically shifted over the last couple of years. And look, for, for those who know me and have been following what we've been doing for a while, I, I'm going to get into my uh, I'm going to make a movie reference now, but it's the movie Network um, in 1976, directed by Sidney Lumet. Um, you know, some of you will know the reference. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, my my own, you know, uh, um, you know, impression of Peter Finch, notwithstanding the. <laughs> The, the real issue here is why has this been allowed to escalate when, you know, it's fantastic that we can have federal policy for permitting reforms, um, you know, faster interconnections, et cetera, et cetera, uh, PTC extension, that's all great. But if you can't actually build projects and if you're having problems at a grassroots level, why has this been allowed to escalate? Uh, that's really the question on leadership and why the shift was made when, you know, the American Wind Energy Association was a standalone association prior to the merger of solar and energy storage um, for ACP, uh, the American Clean Power Association. Why has there been a fundamental shift from grassroots or just uh, effectively ignoring grassroots um, policy to entirely focus, almost entirely focusing on federal policy. Uh, as I've said, I mean, it's great that you can have a production tax credit, but if you can't build a project, those 293 projects that I mentioned before that came up in that Columbia University report, those independent power producers are just as mad as I am about this. Uh, and if you can retroactively kill a project that's been developed, that's a huge risk for the industry. Who's going to do that if a, if a county, like we talked about in Nebraska, if a county can say the noise limit has just been dramatically reduced, you got to stop operating your turbines and all that hundreds of millions of dollars just goes down the drain. That can't happen, right? That, that, that there's no way that wind developers are going to proceed in that state or around, around that area if that continues. And it seems like ACP should have more of a role in trying to understand what the dynamics are and come and stop this going off the deep end because when their prohibitions put in place, once they're established, particularly in county and state level, they're really hard to back out, right? It's a big ordeal. It's not, not it's a big ordeal to unwind them. It's easier, it seems like, to get them installed, to get them off it takes a lot more a lot more work. But don't you think it, it, the risk extends way beyond wind energy to just being pretty scary to any kind of business in general in the area that, you know, the rules can change after you've already laid down your, your capital and um, brought a project to, um, yeah, to this place. They can pull the rug out from, from under you. I, I think that, I mean, that sort of risk of seeming too risky for any kind of business. That's the kind of fear that stops governments from doing this sort of thing usually. So I'm just really surprised that you would want your your region to, you know, you assume that you want to continue to have business in your region and have jobs and that sort of thing. You know, today it's wind farms they don't like, but who knows what it will be tomorrow. Some of these rules, uh, so no county or state or municipality wants to come out and say, we're banning wind turbines or we're banning solar. Nobody's going to do that because it doesn't politically look good. But some of these, and, and this is important to understand, some of these restrictions effectively do do that, right? There's one in we like Wheeler County, no wind turbine within five miles of a dwelling. When was the last time you were in many places? I mean, Australian outback, yes, five miles from a dwelling, I can see that. But in the U.S., even in remote stretches of the U.S., five miles from a dwelling is tough unless you're in a national forest. Yeah, we had that in, in Australia. It's, uh, it's like, I can't remember which part, but some, somewhere it was you could have a coal power plant closer to someone's house than you could have a wind turbine. That's ridiculous. Like, this, like, there's another one in here, three miles from property lines. So there's another level to the argument here, right? Because if you're saying three miles from property lines, okay, now you're stepping into different territory where it's only the largest of large, basically, farms in these areas or, or cattle grazing land that can do that. Well, that's owned also, th those lands are owned by large corporations. So there's some, there's some weirdness there. But I think what one of my 
biggest issues with this. This is something that I've had in the past. Um, is it's less of a technical argument and more of a political argument. Whereas it's it's uh, you know we used to be a country where the the a lot of people even though you may have said I'm conservative I'm liberal I'm centric I'm whatever libertarian there was a lot more people that were in the middle in the past willing to have the conversations and the extremes were smaller now the extremes are growing and the people in the middle are getting small that that portion of the general U S population is getting smaller and smaller and smaller so you get more of these extreme views and these rules from these counties and these uh, municipalities here are they're designed to kill off wind because wind is looked at as this green transition this is a and this is a weird thing to say but that's looked at as some liberal ideology thing i come from a very conservative area in wisconsin and when i tell people that i work in the wind industry as opposed to the oil and gas industry anymore they call me a traitor oh, i can't believe you'd be doing that blah blah blah, blah. like um it's, and to me, it's that again, right there, like, oh, oh, electric vehicles are stupid, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> well, that is not a technical argument. That is a political argument. And I think that that's part of the big problem here in, in the United States and where a lot of these rules are coming from as well. My comments aside from the fact that there should be there is more things that we could be doing as an industry, especially from our industry leadership to be helping uh, to influence some of those conversations. I completely agree with you on that one, Phil. Um but it's but the problem stems in my mind from uh, political arguments, and that's frustrating. And Joel, at the end of the day, the the consequence is what Rosemary touched on before. It's the fact that you are going to dissuade investors from wanting to park money in renewable energy project development. And if that starts happening, then it doesn't really matter what everybody's political view is about anything. ACP is not going to exist. The industry is not going to exist in the form that it currently does. We're going to get a lot smaller very fast. So we, you know, if, if you're going to be a, an institution that is supposedly doing things for the good of the industry, then you need to make sure that the industry thrives in an environment in which it's able to do business. And if they can't do that and they can't facilitate investment coming to this industry and this market, then they need to get out of the way and let somebody else do it. Yeah. I mean, when you're, when you're one of these communities, the majority of all of these communities where wind is, is prevalent in they're rural communities, rural America right now needs cash injection. They need capitalism to come in and support those towns. Uh, they need, you know, the school districts need money. The, if you drive a lot of places, it's it's a sad state when you drive a lot of places across the country. I travel by car a lot. And you go through these little towns and you're like, man, what happened to this town? Like, it looks like it was this big booming, you know, city at one point in time with all these things going on. And it's just broken down building after broken down building everywhere. That's frustrating to see. Um, and so if you're going to do that and then on top of it, basically bite the hand that may feed. Um, you're doubling down on going backwards. It's become a state-by-state -state problem. I don't know when we drove across the Midwest last September uh, we in Nebraska, that we drove through Nebraska and into Colorado. And so as you're driving kind of in southern Nebraska, you can see wind turbines, I think it was in Kansas, and you can see them in Colorado once you cross the state line. It's like, oh, there's all these wind turbines like right close. Like, so if you're sitting in Nebraska looking over, those that, that, that site next door to you, uh, physically, they've got a hundred million dollars in that community, and you don't. You know, at some point, does that neighborly thing become a a visual concern? Like, we're trying to pay for a new school, and we don't have any money. We need a new fire truck. We don't have any money, and yet I drive twenty miles down the road, and they've got all shiny new equipment. I think that leaves a lasting impact. That that will start twisting some arms eventually. Because you're right, Joel. A lot of the rural communities right now are really tough shape, right? Fiscally, they're in really tough shape, but their towns have dwindled, the families have left, there's just a shrunken hole left of what they once were 50, 70 years ago. It's a shame. Drive through West Texas and go through some of the counties that have oil and gas in them and see the nice roads and the, the things they've got going to the $100 million football stadiums for the kids and stuff, right? Cross the border into New Mexico. Outside of Hobbs and Carlsbad, there's nothing. The oil, the oil field stops and those towns are going bankrupt. And it's brutal to watch, but it's the same thing that's being created in the wind industry by these rules. Hopefully ACP can step in and 
bring some sanity to this, because otherwise Phil's right. It's just going to continue, and you're going to have large swaths of the United States where wind turbines and solar are not going to be permitted at all.